Live from Fargo and serving you on TV, online, and on the go, this is Valley News Live at 5. Many questions remain unanswered about what led to the shooting death of an Enderlin, North Dakota man. But we have new information from newly filed court documents. They say surveillance video captured the shooting. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Charges were officially filed in Ransom County Court against 28-year-old Paul Miller. Miller faces two felony charges, one count of murder for the death of Billy Holiday and reckless endangerment for discharging a firearm near a young child. Valley News Team's Ashley Bishop has the court documents and tells us what unfolded. Ashley? These court documents are brief. The information only fills about half the page, and it says the shooting happened about 2.30 a.m. on Sunday. When police arrived on scene, the victim, Billy Holiday, was already dead. The documents go on to say that there is surveillance video that shows 28-year-old Billy Holiday being shot down while dropping off his two-year-old relative. The toddler was just a short distance from Holiday when the shooting occurred. The bullets traveled into the building, and the court document also says there were two males in a vehicle which was parked a short distance away. Because of the ongoing investigation, the sheriff couldn't comment on whose vehicle that was or whether they are looking for other suspects. Court documents go on to say that the suspect, Paul Miller, admitted to multiple family members that he was responsible for the shooting of Holiday and wished to turn himself in. Authorities say they did recover the gun and vehicle used in the murder. Now, the Ransom County Sheriff say they don't think this crime is drug related. Today, I talked to Miller's family to see if they knew why Miller would shoot Holiday. Miller's stepmother says they are going through a tough time and there's more to the story but did not want to comment anymore. Some people have asked why a child was being dropped off to their grandmother at 2.30 a.m. on Sunday. When I spoke to the family member yesterday, she said it was because she was at, a ho at the hospital for an injury sustained earlier in the day and just got home that evening. Andrea? All right, thank you, Ashley. Paul Miller's first court appearance is tomorrow afternoon. Stay with Valley News Live for the latest on this story. Staff members say the thefts have been going on for months, and now they may have come to an end with help from the Fargo Police Department K-9. Two men are facing burglary charges after allegedly breaking into the Children's Museum at Yunker Farm in North Fargo and stealing donation money. Staff members estimate several hundred dollars was taken, but the bigger problem is multiple windows are destroyed. 18-year-old Justin Eback and 19-year-old Richard Langseth allegedly broke into the Children's Museum multiple times. The last time was late Monday night through a basement window. One of the men surrendered after getting a warning, and Falco, the police canine, found the other man hiding in the basement of the museum. Eback and Langseth were arrested and taken to jail to face felony burglary charges. Coming up tonight on Valley News Live at 6, Valley News Team's crime and safety reporter Nicole Johnson shows us how it's impacting the community. Some areas are gearing up for a little snow overnight, but still pretty quiet. Let's head over to Hutch Johnson to find out how much snow we can expect. Hutch? Thanks so much. As we take a look at your radar this evening, not a lot drifting through the valley. We've had a few clouds out there as we head into the evening. It's a fairly quiet day of weather, and the wind took most of the day off as well, although some of our eastern counties are a little breezy. Out to the west, we have snowfall showing up on the radar. It's moving into Bismarck, moving into Minot, and this will be drifting out our direction. So we go through the overnight hours towards tomorrow morning. We could see some spots with isolated locations getting up to five inches. That's from Devil's Lake through Cooperstown and down in toward the Jamestown to Valley City area. Fargo, I think an inch or less here. We'll keep our eyes on this, but for your planner this evening, it's going to be pretty quiet, albeit cloudy, and single-digit readings with a north wind at about 5 miles per hour. If you're up in Grand Forks, it's just a little cooler. We'll be below zero by the time it's midnight if you happen to be out and about uh, playing some pickup basketball or something like that. So, <laughs> All right, thanks so much. A little chilly for that. Yeah, a little bit. Oh, hockey outside. Hockey. Or, you know, now, that's yeah. a little more seasonal. Yeah, yeah, thanks so much. You're welcome. Ice conditions have created a safety concern for an upcoming event in northern Minnesota. Cass County Sheriff Tom Birch says vehicles will not be allowed on Walker Bay on Leech Lake for the annual Eel Pout Festival. The event is scheduled for February 18th through the 21st. Sheriff Birch says there's a large volume of vehicle traffic expected and that's creating a safety concern. 
Vehicle traffic will be restricted to snowmobiles and Class 1 and 2 ATVs. Currently, no other motorized vehicle traffic will be allowed during the event. The event director of the Eel Pout Festival says these restrictions could be lifted depending on the ice conditions and that they'll conduct an ice check on Friday. But the event director says people should plan ahead. Police have identified the owner of a dog that was killed after it attacked another dog and its owner at a Grand Forks dog park last month. However, police are not releasing that name yet because no charges have been filed in the case. Officers have not been able to talk with him. Here's what happened. The attack dog grabbed the neck of another dog and wouldn't let go. The owner of the victim dog was bitten while trying to break them up. He wound up stabbing the attack dog to death with a knife. Top DFL lawmakers are calling on the Minnesota legislature to raise funding to combat terror recruitment after reports surfaced there wasn't much money allocated. This video, released on New Year's Day by Somali terror group Al-Shabaab, shows a number of Minnesotans who have left the U.S. to fight with them. House DFL leader Paul Thiessen, State Representative Phyllis Kahn, and State Rep Representative Yvonne Seltzer call the current funding level woefully inadequate. They want an additional $2 million from the state to fight terror recruitment among the younger populations. Right now, the DFL caucus reports the Countering Violent T Extremism Program in Minnesota has only $896,000, with $216,000 coming from the federal government, $250,000 from the state of Minnesota, and the rest made up of private donations. Last December, the U.S. Congress passed the trillion-dollar omnibus spending bill, and it was signed by President Obama, setting aside $50 million to fight violent extremism nationwide. Valentine's Day is Sunday. Tonight, a look at whether chocolate, one of the top gifts on that day, really acts as an aphrodisiac. Valley News Team's Neil Carlson talks with a UND psychology professor who's been considering this question. Smart kids on Easter egg hunts eventually find what they're looking for, but finding out where chocolate comes from is a lot more challenging. Throughout our lives, most of us associate chocolate with all kinds of positive experiences. When you were a little kid, your mom never said or your dad never said, go to your room, you were bad, and by the way, have some chocolate. You never, we never associate chocolate with bad things. I mean, birthdays, Christmas, Halloween. And of course, chocolate is a staple of Valentine's Day. But Ferraro says the bottom line is that chocolate's aphrodisiac properties, if any, are limited. Sexually speaking, there's no direct scientific link for sexual drive, but it can't hurt? I would say it can't hurt. As far as a direct link, there may be a direct link as far as associations go. Right. Chocolate, positive, you know. Right. Who knows? So apparently the gift of chocolate on Valentine's Day can't hurt if you're betting on it working as an aphrodisiac. However, the experts say that science just doesn't have any clear evidence yet that it actually works. In Grand Force, Neil Carlson, Valley News Live. Oh, and by the way, it's estimated Americans will spend $350 million on chocolate during this Valentine's week. Today marks the 100th anniversary of the New Hampshire primary, a state with an unusual election system that allows undeclared voters to cast ballots during the primary. About 44 percent of voters are independent, meaning presidential candidates can compete across party lines. Ben Carson hopes to capture last-minute votes and narrow the field among Republican presidential candidates. I, th I think we'll be left with probably just uh, four or five people. Do you see yourself as one of those four or five people? I do, absolutely. New Hampshire has 1.33 million residents. More than 870,000 of them are registered to vote. It's an art form you often see in churches, but it's getting more and more popular in people's homes. Stained glass windows used to be standard in homes, but now it's a way to express your style. Studio Renaissance does everything from restoration for churches to custom-made windows. They also offer classes taught right in the studio. A piece of stained glass, no matter the number of colors, can be a way to add something unique to a new or old home. Just another way of kind of giving that personal fingerprint on your own place, you know, like that identity to help separate yourself and from others so that, you, you know, when you come over, you know, you have something new to show and something that's not just, that can be bought at the store. 
To get signed up for classes or to order a piece for your home, we have a link to the Studio Renaissance webpage on our webpage. Uh, click on the hot button at valleynewslive.com.